Well, hey there and good morning. Thank you so much for joining Waterloo Road Baptist Church online this morning. As your family is spread out across the city worshiping in your home, we want to encourage you to feel free to sing along as we sing these songs of praise to the name of Jesus. Feel free to stand up or sit down or have coffee nearby or, or dance around with your kiddos in your home. We want to make sure that this is a time of worship because this is the day that the Lord has made. We'd also encourage you uh, to comment in the box provided below by YouTube. Let us know who you're worshiping with and, and how we can be praying for you as a church family. Is there a need this week that we can meet? Or is there something that we could celebrate, something great that happened this week that we can celebrate with you as a church family? As we're spread out across our city this morning, we hope that this service does a couple things. That it encourages and equips you to make disciples wherever you are. We want to leverage this time apart using online services like this to encourage each other, to build each other up in love and in good works, and that the family of God would increase exponentially, church. We're so thankful that you're here this morning. Let me pray as we jump into our service. Father, we love you, and we're so thankful uh, to be a church apart, but a church so close together this morning as we worship in spirit and in truth. Lord, may you bless our time together in our homes with our children, with our husbands and wives. Uh, Lord, that you would do a great and mighty work this morning. We pray for lives across our entire world infected um, by the coronavirus. Lord, that you would do an incredible thing and, and wipe this thing away. Lord, we trust you. We love you. Be with us as we worship this morning. In your name I pray. Amen. sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me song melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above praise the mount i'm fixed upon it mount of sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to Thee. I'm prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. I'm prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for Thy courts above. Hello, church family. I will be reading Psalm 16 for you. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave nor will you let the Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. 
you will fill me with your joy in presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand.
I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Good morning. Today I'm going to read from Mark 6, verses 7 through 13. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belt. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off of your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people in oil and healed them. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest, I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness and lost in his love this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long perfect submission perfect Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, I'm praising my Savior all the day long. Well, here we are. It's the Sunday after Easter, and that can feel sort of anticlimactic. You know, the church builds all year towards that great Easter Sunday, and then the next Sunday, it's like, well, what do we do now? And, and here's the good news. If I could say last week on Easter Sunday, he is risen, and you might respond, he is risen indeed. Today, I could say he is still risen. And if you were all here, I'm sure you would answer, he is still risen indeed. And so uh, the next week uh, is equally uh, important and has equal power to Easter Sunday. And every week on the calendar does because every Sunday we celebrate he is risen, he is risen indeed. And so this morning, we're just going to look at the next passage. We did John chapter 20 last week. Today, we're moving into John chapter 21. And let's talk about a big fish story. I'm going to read you a quote from Frederick Beekner, The Magnificent Defeat. He says, Sacred moments, the moments of miracle, are often everyday moments. The moments which if we do not look with more than our eyes or listen with more than our ears, reveal only a garden, 
or a stranger coming down the road behind us, or a meal like any other meal. But if we look with our hearts, if we listen with our being and imagination, what we may see is Jesus himself. John 21 recounts just such an ordinary moment that becomes a sacred moment. It was a day about as ordinary as any day you'd find in first century Galilee. As we open and look at this John chapter 21, it's a day of fishing, a day of frustration, a day of sharing a meal with friends. But that ordinary backdrop becomes the backdrop for an extraordinary moment, a sacred moment, a moment of grace. John 21 immediately follows anything but ordinary events. John 21 opens with men in Galilee fishing. That's pretty ordinary, but it follows on the heels of anything but ordinary events. We've seen already in John, we've seen Mary going to the tomb, discovering it's empty, running to find the disciples, the disciples, Peter and the beloved disciple, running to the tomb, discovering it's empty, discerning that Jesus is alive. We've seen Jesus appear to his disciples and breathe on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. We see him appear uh, to the disciples and then to Thomas. And Thomas sees the scars in his hands and his side and his feet and declares, my Lord and my God. Those are not ordinary moments. Those are some of the most extraordinary moments in human history. And yet we turn to John chapter 21. What's next? And we've been following these, th these three years of Jesus training these disciples. And now he's raised from the dead and they're well aware of it. And we wonder, what's next? What will they do now? And the stage is set for something rather extraordinary. And yet what we find here in John 21 seems rather ordinary and unremarkable. So let's look at it. It begins with going fishing. In chapter John chapter 21, verses 1 through 3, John writes, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened like this. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. So this chapter opens by telling us something extraordinary is going to happen. The first words were afterward Jesus appeared again to his disciples. But until that happens, it could not be more ordinary. Here are these disciples about a week after Jesus is raised from the dead. And are you a little curious about what they're doing now? I mean, what's life going to look like after the resurrection? And the scene that we see here, it's almost as if nothing has happened. They're sitting on the beach trying to decide what to do. Well, what are fishermen going to do now? Well, they're probably going to want to go out and fish. If you remember when Jesus called Peter and Andrew and James and John, and at least three of those four are listed as being here uh, at this, at, in this scene, Three of those first four, or three of the, four, uh, the seven that are mentioned here, are fishermen. Jesus calls Peter and James and John as he's walking down the shore, and they're fishing. So they're fishermen. So what are fishermen going to do at, at a moment like this? Well, Peter says, I'm going to go fish. And Peter's sort of the leader of the group. He's the spokesman of the group. I'm not surprised that at least six of the other disciples would say, well, we'll go with you. And so off they go to fish and they fish all night. And there's nothing remarkable about that night of fishing except they didn't catch anything. And, and the way John describes it, but that night they caught nothing. So their all night fishing expedition netted not one fish. After three years of being with Jesus, we might wonder at this moment, not only did, did he not produce first rate disciples, because at this moment, we've not seen them do very much. But it's not clear whether or not after three years of training, he's produced first-rate fishermen. The only thing remarkable, remarkable, remarkable about this night fishing is they got skunked. 
or whatever phrase you use when you don't catch anything after a, a long period of fishing. Nothing exceptional about this. Uh, my son likes to fish now. He's sort of uh, taken up fishing and uh, it seems like more often than not when he comes back in, how'd it go? He says, I didn't catch anything. Nothing, nothing remarkable about that. That's what happens most of the time, it seems to me, when people go out and fish. They catch nothing. And that's what happens with these, these disciples. So although the story begins with a hint that something extraordinary is going to happen afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples. At this moment, it couldn't be more ordinary. Fishermen going out to fish and not catching anything. But the next scene involves catching fish. So we see them going fishing in 1 through 3, and now in verses 4 through 14, we see them catching fish. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that would almost certainly be John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he'd raised from the dead. So this ordinary night of fishing is over, catching nothing. And at that moment, as they're coming into the shore, about 100 yards away, about daybreak, this man appears on the shore that they don't recognize. We find out that it's Jesus, but at this point, they don't, re re they don't realize that. And you can imagine Jesus cupping his hand and calling out to them, how many did you catch? And they answer back, none. And so this man that they don't recognize at this point says to them, cast your net on the right side of the boat. That's the starboard side. Uh, for novices like me, I had to look that kind of stuff up. But the starboard, starboard side of the boat, the right side of the boat, cast your net on the right side of the boat. And these uh, disciples, seven of them, not yet recognizing this as Jesus, after a night of fishing, casting the net, no doubt fatigued, muscles aching, are willing to give it one more try before they call it a night. And so they cast the net, just as this man has instructed them, on the right side. And the result was a catch so large that they could hardly reel it in. John is very specific. 153. Does it, does it strike you the least bit odd that John would be so specific? 153. And if it were a number like 144 or 12 or 10 or 7 or 3 uh, or uh, 144,000 or some number that might clearly have some symbolic value, we might understand why he would mention it. But 153, that's not a number that appears anywhere else in Scripture. So what's going on here? When you look in the history of interpretation, you go back 2,000 years of interpretation of the Bible in the church, you'll find a lot of early church fathers like Augustine or Gregory the Great or Jerome making a, quite a big deal out of this 153 number. Augustine, the early church father Augustine, one of the most important theologians in the history of the church, argued that the 153 number is symbolic of the salvation of all people. And here's how he figured that. He said, 
10 is the number of the Ten Commandments and thus represents the law. Seven uh, is the number of the sevenfold spirit, Holy Spirit. And if you look in Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, it does make reference to the sevenfold spirit. And it's not talking about seven spirits. It's the sevenfold spirit is the Holy Spirit. And so uh, I, think, I think Augustine would have said, and I would agree, that the sevenfold spirit is just a way of referring to the perfection of the Holy Spirit. It's still referring just to the Holy Spirit. So he says, the ten represents the Ten Commandments, the law. The seven represents the, the, the sevenfold spirit of the Holy Spirit. And he argued the law uh, in and of itself can't give life. But the law, when energized by the Holy Spirit, when you bring the Holy Spirit into the equation, now you have life. And so the ten plus the seven is 17. And it represents sort of the law and gospel, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant. And so you get 17. If you add up the numbers, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. You know, 1 plus 2 is 3. Uh, 3 plus 3 is 6. Uh, 6 plus 4 is 10. Uh, 10 plus 5 is 15. And you just keep adding the numbers all the way to 17. Guess what you get? That's right, 153. Gregory, Gregory the Great, another early church father, does something similar with it. He takes the 10 and the 7 like Augustine. So you got the 17. He says you multiply 17 times 3, which represents the Trinity, and you get 51. And then you multiply that again by 3, which represents the Trinity, and you get 153. And so he again points to it as a way uh, of symbolizing salvation for all people. Jerome, again, the, the fourth century theologian, said there was a, the 153 coincides with 153 species of fish in the Sea of Galilee in, in the first century. Now, I can't verify that there was 153 species of fish in the Sea of Galilee in the first century, but that's what Jerome argued, and thus it represents sort of the picture of drawing the whole world into the net of God's love. Every species of human being, like every species of fish, being drawn into the net. Whatever the reason, this was a moment of uncommon grace. This was not an ordinary catch of fish. It was rather extraordinary. Now, does it symbolize salvation for all people? It could. Augustine, Gregory the Great, Jerome, they might all be on to something. But it's also possible that it just means there was a big catch of fish. And why would John be specific about 153? Well, based on the fishing expeditions I know and the fishermen that I know, if they had a catch this extraordinary, I can imagine them pulling it into the boat and looking at that large catch of fish and somebody saying, wow, I've never seen a catch like that before. And somebody else saying, I wonder how many are there. And you wouldn't get out of the boat that day until you counted every one of those. So you'd have in your story that you're going to tell the rest of your life about the night we caught 153 large fish. I'm not surprised that John would recall 153. Maybe it's symbolic of the salvation of all people. Maybe it just means this was a large catch of fish. And I tend to want to think that. Maybe it seems a little ordinary that he would record 153 just because there was a large catch of fish, but maybe that's part of the point. Maybe it's a reminder that Jesus is there even in the ordinary moments of life. Most of our lives that we live moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day, do not seem to us to be particularly extraordinary. In fact, life can seem mundane, pedestrian, unremarkable. I mean, as we're sheltering at home these days, I'm sure the days tend to bleed together and not a lot of extraordinary things are happening. But it's important to recognize that Jesus is there in the ordinary moments of life just as he is in the extraordinary moments of life. We need Jesus in the car 
when we're driving from one location to another. We need Jesus at the office when we're at work. We need Jesus with us when we're grocery shopping. We need Jesus with us in the classroom. We need to know that Jesus is with us uh, on the soccer field or on the basketball court. We need to know that Jesus is with us in the sheltering at home quarantine. That in the ordinary events of our lives, Jesus is there with us. St. Teresa of Avila, the 16th, 16th century Spanish nun and author, in her uh, book, the, the Book of the Foundations, says it this way, Know that even when you are in the kitchen, amidst the pots and the pans, the Lord is there. Our Lord moves amidst the pots and the pans. You can't get more ordinary than that. We need a Savior who accompanies us on the everyday journeys of life, who's there with us in the ordinary circumstances and speaks into those times and places. This is one of those sacred moments, the extraordinary intruding into the ordinary, a moment of grace. Now, all this happened on a beach around a campfire, but it's also important to note that Jesus is with us in the extraordinary moments of life. Now, I've just made the argument that Jesus is with us in the ordinary, but he's also with us in the extraordinary. And when I think about extraordinary moments of life, I think about those moments of suffering. I think about moments of sickness, moments of death and dying. Those are those extraordinary moments in life, the moments that we often do not forget easily. Jesus is there with us in those moments also. It's nice to talk about resurrection power as I'm standing here uh, in front of this, uh, this camera, videoing this sermon. It's nice to talk about it if we're sitting around uh, watching it at home on Sunday morning. It's nice to talk about resurrection power on a Zoom uh, Sunday school class session. It's a completely other thing to recognize the resurrection power of Jesus in the face of death and dying. Thanks be to God that the resurrection power of Jesus shows up in the ER. In the extraordinary moment of sitting in the waiting room uh, awaiting news uh, of a loved one's health. Getting a report from the doctor and the doctor comes out and says, we did everything we could. Thanks be to God that Jesus' resurrection power is with us in, in that moment. Thanks be to God that Jesus' resurrection power is with us in the funeral home. When you walk in and you catch a glimpse of your mother lying in the casket and you see just to catch a glimpse of her face and it hits you like a punch in the stomach and it knocks the breath out of you. Thanks be to God that Jesus' resurrection power is there with us in the ER, in the funeral home, in the house where people are, are making crack cocaine that feels like a death house where people are dying a slow death because of their addiction to drugs it's good to know that jesus resurrection power can show up there also how about the nursing home thanks be to god that the resurrection power of jesus is present in a nursing home where strong and able-bodied men and women or who were strong and able-bodied at one time now sort of watch their lives wasting away and come to realize that at this point, they're just waiting on death. Jesus shows up where death is because that's where we need it most. Jesus is with us in the ordinary, but he's also with us in the extraordinary. And that's our hope. That's the hope of Easter that just keeps coming back to life every day, both in the ordinary and the extraordinary. Easter just keeps on happening. And this is the good news that we can live with and die with. He is still risen. He is still risen indeed. Now, the beloved disciple recognizes that this is Jesus. 
that it's not just some guy standing on the beach telling them to cast their net on the right side of the boat, that it's actually Jesus, that it's a moment of grace. He's appearing again to them. And he tells Peter, it's the Lord. And the moment that Peter hears that, he reacts by putting his coat on because he'd taken it off and jumping into the water to get to the shore. It appears that it's an act of of his, his passion, his love for Jesus. He can't wait till the boat gets to shore. He's jumping in and getting there as quickly as possible. Now, it's unusual because have you ever seen anyone put their clothes on to jump into the water? Usually you see people peeling clothes off to jump into the water. He's putting his coat on. But it's it's almost irrational. He's just got to get to the shore to see the Lord while the others come in on the boat. And it's about 100 yards out. I would guess that they're arriving there at the shore at about the same time. And if you listen closely, you might hear the crackle of the fire. If you'll just use your imagination, you might be able to smell the smoke. You might hear the sizzle of the fish, catch something of the aroma of freshly baked bread. If you'll just let your imagination work a moment, you might be able to imagine the coarse faces of those seven disciples. Maybe their bloodshot eyes because they've been fishing all night and haven't slept. And if you listen closely, You might just hear the plop, plop, plop of the water dripping off of Peter's soaking wet coat. And in that moment, I can imagine uh, them wondering what's the Lord going to say. I mean, this looks like where we might hear some profound statement from the resurrected Jesus to these disciples standing on the shore. And so here they are, the fire is crackling, the fish is sizzling, and they're waiting for Jesus to speak, maybe with profound words. And what does he say? You boys hungry? Well, have a seat. Shockingly ordinary. And that leads us to the last few verses, feeding sheep. So we've gone fishing, we've caught fish, and now we're feeding sheep. Verse 15, when they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said, then take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. The scene changes rather quickly away from just sharing fish over a fire over a campfire, to the men, these seven disciples with Jesus, sitting around the fire, not a lot of words spoken, it appears, or at least they're not recorded between Jesus and Peter. In fact, in John's gospel, there's not been one word spoken between them since Peter had denied Jesus when he was standing in the courtyard of the high priest. Not one word has been spoken between them. And Jesus breaks the silence, by looking across that fire and asking Peter this question, do you love me? Three times he will ask him the same question, do you love me? And it's almost as if Jesus is giving Peter the opportunity to redeem himself from his three denials of Jesus. Maybe Peter's remembering standing over another fire not many days before in the courtyard of the high priest. Maybe Peter's remembering three denials. Maybe Peter's remembering when asked, do you know him? Are you with him? Maybe Peter's remembering saying, absolutely not. I don't even know who he is. I'm sure Peter's thought quite a bit about that over the last few days and probably felt a great deal of guilt and anxiety over it. And now, Jesus is asking him, do you love me? 
giving him the opportunity to erase each one of those denials with an affirmation, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Words are not sufficient, however. In each case, Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And in each case, Jesus says, then feed my sheep, then care for my flock. Words are not sufficient. There is work to be done. Show me you love me. So much in this story feels familiar. Peter's failure, public embarrassment, private disappointment in himself, maybe the pain of not living up to expectations. And I'm struck by what Jesus doesn't say to him. You would expect Jesus to say, at least I told you so. Because Jesus had said, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows and Peter said, oh, absolutely not. I'll never. And then, of course, he did. We would expect Jesus to say, I told you so. Or at least, what were you thinking? Or, you owe me an apology. None of that. Just a simple question. Do you love me? And it, it looks like a picture of redemption, of forgiveness. It's a picture of unconditional love. And isn't that what we're all longing for? To find that kind of acceptance and that kind of unconditional love. And it's difficult for human beings to offer it. But there is one who offers us that kind of love, that kind of forgiveness, that kind of unconditional love. And his name is Jesus. And maybe you're looking for that today. Maybe you're longing for that in your life. Maybe you're feeling the pressure of these circumstances. Maybe you're feeling anxiety. Maybe you're feeling unloved. Maybe you're feeling imperfect. Maybe you're carrying guilt. The good news, even after Easter, is that Jesus loves you. He loves you unconditionally. And he's waiting with his arms open to accept you. It's also true that there is work to be done. And in response to Jesus' question, do you love me? I hope our response is yes. His response then is, well then get busy. Take care of my flock. Feed my sheep. There is work to be done. So let's get with it. As we come to this time of prayer together as a church family, I want to thank you for your prayers, for myself, for the rest of our staff, for our other leaders. But let's go to this time of prayer together, thanking God for his richest blessings upon us as a church during this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you for all that you are doing in the life of our church. Lord, we thank you that even though we have been apart, that Lord, in some miraculous way that we have felt closer to each other uh, in ways than we have felt in, in many days. Uh, Lord, I pray, uh, Lord, for our continued uh, wisdom as we look forward to the next few days and weeks and as we transition back to having uh, worship and activities within our church campus, Lord, I pray for wisdom and guidance. Uh, Lord, we also uh, come before you thanking you for your love and your grace and your mercy in our lives. Uh, Lord, we thank you uh, for all that you're doing in the lives of our families within our church. And Lord, as you continue to work in and through us, uh, Lord, we thank you for the opportunities that you've given us uh, to share your love and your hope with a lost world during these days. And Father, we also lift up during this day, this 25-year anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombing. Lord, we lift up the families of those who continue to uh, need your love and care during this day. And Father, we lift them up to you right now. Uh, Father, we lift up each and every one of those families. Uh, Father, we also lift up our uh, uh, leaders within our state, our local leaders, uh, our national leaders as they make decisions to, to reopen and to, to get back to life uh, as we live uh, in community together. Father, give us wisdom and guidance uh, as we move forward. Uh, Lord, we also uh, just come before you today uh, 
uh, thanking you for the opportunity that we have to worship you, uh, to praise you. Father, we lift up our pastor search committee to you. Lord, we ask that you would give them wisdom and guidance as they move forward uh, with who you have for your church. And Father, we also thank you for Dr. Kelly. And Lord, we thank you for how he is ministering to us uh, during this, these days. And Father, we uh, ask that you would just continue to speak in and through him. And the Lord, that we would listen to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus 
Good morning, church family. Let me start by saying that I hope that you are all staying safe and healthy during this world pandemic. My thoughts and prayers are with all of you. I miss you, and I hope to see you soon. Please join me as we read from God's Word, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Good morning, church family. At this time, let's uh, bow our, our uh, heads for prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the many, many blessings that you've given us, Lord. We know that these times are uh, difficult and, and very uncertain, but Lord, we know that you're always in control of, of all things that happen. Uh, we thank you for the technology that allows us to be together, even as, as we're separated. Uh, we thank you for our ministry staff and, and all the hard work that they do to ensure that, that we come together and, and stay together in, in prayer and praise of you. Lord, we thank you for the folks that are working so tirelessly to uh, fight this uh, pandemic, the doctors and the nurses and the EMT and, and all those folks on the front line, the uh, essential workers, those that uh, so many times we take for granted, this grocery store clerk and, and those who uh, are there every day taking care of our needs. Lord, we uh, ask for the Holy Spirit to uh, open our hearts and minds this morning as we uh, hear the message. Uh, Lord, we uh, seek to be more like you each and every day and, and hopefully in this time of, of separation and time where we have more time to uh, to think about you and, and dwell on you that we become closer to you and Lord we lift up this nation and and uh, pray for the heart and soul of it as uh, it has drifted so far away that hopefully during this time uh, they can come back to you again Lord uh, we thank you for all things in Christ's name Amen have a great morning. Hey, church family, thank you so much for joining us today. I want to say thank you to those who have been faithful to give, especially over the last month. We know that this has been a strange time, and we're thankful for your faithfulness in this way. We want to encourage you to continue to give. Obviously, even though we are not meeting together in person, we still have ministry-related expenses that we have to take care of, uh, whether those are building costs, uh, taking care of staff, um, or just other ministry-related expenses like taking care of the needs of those that are in our church and in our community. 
We want to be able to continue to operate even though we're having to walk through this time of social distancing. So I want to encourage you to continue to be faithful in your giving. Uh, there's a couple different ways you can do that. There's some texting instructions that have popped up on the screen um, as I've been talking. Uh, you can also go online and give, or you can drop off your check or your money by the church office. If you need any sort of help on how to do any of those processes I just mentioned, please call our church office anytime this week, and someone will be more than happy to walk you through that process and help you get that set up. Church, let's pray together before we continue on. Father, we love you. We're thankful for your faithfulness to us. I pray that your presence will continue to be with us as we walk through this season. Father, may we continue to be faithful to you, both in the way that we give and both in our own personal obedience to you. And Father, we love you. And we ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you, church family, for joining us online this week. Before we go, we just have a few announcements for you. Uh, the first announcement we have is we want to encourage you all to stay connected. Um, there's three things we want you to connect with. One, we want you guys to stay connected to the church. Um, as you know, we are going to be closed through April 30th. But as we update and move forward, that information is going to be on our social media sites. So if you're not already um, connected that way, make sure that you do that. Second, we want you guys to stay connected to your small groups. Um, many small groups meet on Zoom or other ways, uh, so make sure you reach out to your leaders. If you're not sure who your small group leader is, you can contact the church and we can help get you their contact information. Um, and then we also want you to, the guys to stay connected with one another. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to be reaching out to one another, praying for one another. Um, so give each other a call, a text, or an email, um, and just make sure that you guys are staying connected. The second announcement we have um, involves prayer requests. We love to hear from you guys, love to be able to pray for you guys. So during the online time, you can drop a prayer request in our chat box, or if you're more comfortable, you can contact the church office or someone on staff and let us know what we can be praying for you um, during this time. Um, third announcement we have is uh, we want to be a resource for you guys to help provide you with your day-to-day -day needs. We have a team ready to go out and help you with your shopping, to pick up your medication, or just be able to fulfill some of those needs that maybe you need help with. Um, so don't hesitate to call us, um, let us know in the church office, and we can make sure that we get someone in contact with you to help you out like that. The last thing I wanted to leave you guys with is just a little word of encouragement or a little something that I've been learning during this time. Um, this last week, I've been studying Joseph and his life. Beginning in Exodus 37, Joseph began a period of time where he kept getting placed in situations that were beyond his control. Um, times where he had to wait for others to either help him or wait for others to tell him what was going to happen next. During this time, he could have spent um, his time complaining. He could have been angry. He could have been upset. But Joseph instead chose to do something completely different. He chose to continue to look for God and to have hope during those times of darkness. He chose to wait and listen and to diligently serve God wherever he was at, whether it was in a pit, whether it was in his master's home, whether it was in jail, he continued to serve God in everything that he did. So right now, you know, we are facing difficult times that are completely beyond our control. But we can also learn to have that hope. We can also learn to look towards God and to serve him diligently during this time. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's our prayer during this time that you are filled with joy, that you're filled with peace, and that you trust God. Well, church, thank you again for being a part of the service today. Remember to stay connected with one another, stay safe, and be blessed. We'll talk to you soon.